This is the Creative Funding Show, a podcast for authors, YouTubers, and podcasters who want to fund the work they love without selling out. Welcome back to the Creative Funding Show. I'm Thomas Umstadt Jr. And with me today is Joanna Penn, who is an award-winning novelist, New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of thrillers under the pen name J.F. Penn. And she also writes nonfiction for authors. She's an award-winning creative, entrepreneur, podcaster, and YouTuber. Her site, thecreativepen.com, was voted one of the top 100 sites for writers by Writer's Digest. Joanna Penn, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Thomas. It's great to be here and talk to you again. Yeah, it's, I, I love having you on the Creative Funding Show because of the different ways that we talk about for creative creatives to fund their art. You have done almost all of them. I think the only thing you haven't gotten into yet is merchandise. I don't think people can buy Joanna Penn. Oh, actually, no, that's that's not true. I now have. (laughs) There you go. I I do have like a mug um, and a bag um, that you can get on Society6. Um, So, And I got into that because I had someone on my podcast who talked about merchandising. And I was like, okay, so I need to do only print on demand because I like the digital scalability. I don't want to do stuff I have to put in boxes. So um, Society6, it's good quality, you know, sort of print on demand merch. Uh, so I've made about $6 in total out of mugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's it's not what the great, six is yeah. for? It's for the $6 yeah. that you make on their website? <laughs> Basically. But yes, I do pretty much everything else. Very cool. Well, that, that's, that's exciting. And so you really do check all of the boxes. But I want to get started uh, with your story and how you got into this, because you did not emerge from the chrysalis as a creator who was doing everything and, and doing it well. Uh, where did you get started writing? Sure. So I was actually, um, I did theology at university and then I went into management consultancy, which is one of those random things you do in Britain um, and ended up working, uh, implementing financial systems into large corporates um, for about 13 years after college. And, you know, really one of those jobs that is golden handcuffs. They paid really well, but my life was completely pointless. And I just spent my time in accounts payable departments being hated by people because I was replacing them. (laughs) Basically, you know, I know that's outsource everything to this IT system. And here's this woman who's going to put you all out of a job. So, you know, I got to this point where I was just miserable, miserable in my working life, even though I was being paid well. And I had a house and a mortgage and all that husband and, and everything. And I was I've always journaled. And I just I got to this point where I was like, I have to do something more with my life. What do I want to do? Couldn't work that out. So I decided to start researching how to change your career. And then I thought, well, I'm reading a lot of self-help books, listening to a lot of audio tapes uh, or sort of, um, were they even, I think they were CDs at that point, uh, you know, sort of the <laughs> early days, sort of 2005, um, you know, of, of digital media and uh, started, you know, thought, oh, well, I, I could write a book on how to change your career. And I ended up writing that book. It was called something else and, um, you know, but wrote that first nonfiction book. And in the process of writing it, learned about writing, learned about the internet, learned about how to start doing sales of books and speaking and all of that and then ended up getting into fiction uh, left my job in 2011 to do it full-time and uh, 2015 got my husband out of his job Uh, so basically at this point as we talk I've been writing like professionally as in writing for publication for about 12 years and have been full-time uh, for seven years so yeah I, I guess I'm quite far down the journey now but I still absolutely remember being miserable in my job just thinking what am I doing with my life and not knowing what was coming and this was before the kindle before podcasting before any of this so you know it really was pretty hopeless back then <laughs> yeah we were scratching books on stone tablets it was yeah very exactly oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like writing in the early days of the indie revolution? Because you've been independent the whole time, right? You never went with a traditional publisher. No, exactly right. And the main reason, I think, is because I'm, I'm a businesswoman. So I was in, biz, in working in business. I was working in accounting departments. I'm not an accountant, but I was amongst the money side of business. I was also earning a good wage. And when I looked at the possibilities for leaving my day job to become a writer, it was actually impossible at that point. I could not see how I could make a six-figure income 
as a, a writer just make, writing books um, you would have to hit some kind of lottery or the other thing I learned is that you could do it by being a speaker so that was actually my first uh, what I did first I, I went to professional speakers association I learned how to speak professionally and started charging for my speaking and all the speakers that were in that community and I was in Australia at that point um, they all learned from the Americans so it was a very American dominated niche the, the speaker's niche and I learned brilliantly I think because British people are quite different um, I learned that I needed to start charging early and this is something that's very important and why I think it's great that you're talking about this on your show um, being an author it's not just about making money from book sales. So I started making my first money as a speaker and I had a book to sell, but I never even, um, I think I sent one query letter and then didn't hear back and was just like, okay, that's random. Why can't I just print it myself and sell it myself? Um, and I just went ahead with that. So it was very much a business decision and it still is. <laughs> it still is a business decision. So that's kind of how I got started. And that's really smart because in fiction, especially traditional fiction, there's not a lot of middle class. You have people who are making basically no money, and then you have people who are making millions of dollars, right? J.K. Rowling, wealthier than the Queen, supposedly, right? Because she sold a million Harry Potter books. But there's not a lot of middle class, whereas in speaking and, and writing business books, there's more of a middle class. So it's easier to get started and actually bring in some income, and it's less of a lottery. It's less of a big you know, statistical anomaly. Yeah, I think the difference is as well, though, um, is your mindset around intellectual property rights. So the issue with speaking is that you are paid for your time and therefore it's exactly like a day job. And I realised this very early on that creating intellectual property rights uh, and a book is intellectual property rights. You can then licence that over and over again. So while you will get spike income from speaking, a book can make you, you know, maybe each copy sells a lot less than one speaking gig, but you can sell that potentially for the rest of your life and 70 years after you die. So the the midlist, and there are a group of authors called the midlist, and I would be one of those. Um, the midlist authors in the world. Um, so I have 27 books right now, um, uh, 18 of which are fiction. Uh, and I make, you know, I make a multi six figure income. I make six figures from my book sales. That is a kind of mid list type um, living for a writer. And there are quite a few writers in that um, area. But as you say, m many, many, many authors and in fact painters um illustrators you know name an artist <laughs> most <laughs> artists are not making um a lot of money or even a living wage from their art uh, i think the difference is this attitude of um business and also understanding intellectual property rights and being being paid for licensing your assets as opposed to being paid for your time that's right, because it, it's in a sense, it's kind of like you're going through the whole arc of civilization. So at the beginning, we were hunter-gatherers, right? We'd hunt, and you'd find a woolly mammoth, and everyone would eat for a month, but then you'd have nothing after that. And that's kind of like what speaking is, whereas writing and creating intellectual property is more like farming, where you get this slow, consistent source of food that's not nearly as exciting, but it's ultimately what's going to sustain a civilization in the long run. That's exactly right. And in fact, that's I think also the difference between traditional publishing and indie publishing. Um, and when I say indie publishing, I mean independent. I'm an independent author, but I, I pay professionals, cover designers, um, uh, you know, editors. I, I do a professional job of independent publishing. I don't do it all myself, which is why I don't like self-publishing. But with traditional publishing, generally you will get an advance. So you'll get a spike income that will come in and then you might and you, that will be split into payments depending on when you sign the contract when you hand in the manuscript when they publish it and then if you get royalties they will be maybe every six months and who knows for how long depending on if you earn out so you get you might get more money you might hit that lottery you might get you know a big payment um and then it might disappear because they're on to the next author with indie with publishing as an indie what's happened is my income as you say, is quite boring, but it's stepped up pretty much every month. So since I first put my first book on Kindle back in sort of 2008, 2009, um, my income has stepped up pretty much every month consistently. And I've never had a breakout. I'm not famous, but I'm making a good living 
as a writer and with all the other things we'll talk about but just with the books alone it's a case of that consistent drip 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 for multiple streams of income every month and and that is exciting in that it funds my life <laughs> having food it, on the table is exciting <laughs> exactly but it's not like oh sexy seven figure deal you know it's not sexy money but it's like living money which to me is pretty sexy so you know <laughs> that's right that's right and it's that is ultimately what's more sustainable yes it's and also I I can, you know, you can't, when you don't know when that money's coming in, how can you do a cash flow forecast? How can you say, yes, I know I can pay my mortgage next month when you don't know when that's mon- when that money comes in? Whereas what I love about what, what you're doing here, talking about Patreon, talking about recurring revenue, actually self-publishing or independently publishing is like a salary. I essentially get a salary from, uh, well, it's not a salary, but, you know, I get a, um, a an amount of money every month from, you know, that is pretty predictable and I know what it's going to be 60 days in advance. So I can do a cash flow forecast. And that to me is you have to have that to make a living. It's so important. Now, I know some of you listening, as soon as you heard the phrase cash flow forecast, you tuned out. You're like, oh, that's business stuff. I just want to do art. And I think that that dichotomy is really unhealthy because what enables you to do art and to have that emotional room to really create your best work is not having to worry about money so much, right? If you're like panicked or like, oh, this has to be a hit to cover all of my debts that are accruing, that amount of pressure actually, I think, constrains your creativity in some ways. And so it's not about art and business being at war with each other. It's about them being on a team together. If, if you're crafting your life in the right way and thinking about your art as a business of creating art, it re- I think it really should go hand in hand like what you're doing. Yes, and I do hope that the listeners to the Creative Funding Show... <laughs> And I know this will go out on the other show as well, but this is, you know, this is about the money side. And to me, business is one of the most creative things that we do. And, um, you know, a, a, most of what we see in the world is created through people doing business. And that to me is exciting. You can create jobs. You can, like I, I work with at the moment, I work with about 13 different contractors. Not only do I pay, you know, my husband's tax and my tax with our company, we're also paying money to our whole load of freelancers we've got our own self-sustaining little industry Um, you know the money comes in and the money goes out and and that's that's the way cash flow should work it comes in it goes out you're building your assets you're living you're loving your life I mean to me that you know entrepreneurs turn ideas in their head into value in the world whether that's value for someone else or value for them and that's what we do as writers or as any kind of artists you're turning what's in your head into value in the world and and like if that's not entrepreneurial or business you know I don't know what is (laughs) and and that's really exciting because you're making the world a better place you're making the people who read your writings happy or entertained and that's a good thing you're providing for yourself which is a good thing and you're creating jobs which is a good thing and you're doing it in a sustainable way this is what i love so much about business the media portrays businesses like it's the evil exploitative people it's like no these are people who are making the world a better place because no one's going to give you their money unless you're able to convince them that you're making their life better in some way to be worth giving you their money right that's the difference between being a thief and being a business person (laughs) Mm, and and i think it's it's much better to be putting money back into the system to be paying like you will as you earn more you will pay more tax and I'm like yay let's pay more tax and fund all the things we want you know I'm very I'm very happy with the situation I'm in and I I I I think it's very important to talk about money and one of the issues with creatives and money is as you say there is this kind of dichotomy people think that if they are making money they've kind of in inverted commas sold out and um, I was talking to a musician and he was like well selling out is what you want to do like you want to have a sold out (laughs) concert like you want people to be you know at the door kind of but I think it's very important to say like I write the books I want to write I've never um compromised on that so I very much do the things that I care about I if I wanted to just do stuff for money I would have stayed in the day job but um I love what I write you know I really just really enjoy what I do and also I love the lifestyle I have and one of the things I when I left my day job is I said to myself well what is my ideal life and my ideal life was um, writing reading and traveling 
and that's what I do. That's pretty much what I do. And uh, and helping other people as well. I help a lot of people. <laughs> there you go. It's a good gig if you can get it. And I want to talk a little bit about how you've uh, crafted that life. Because your money isn't just coming from royalties. It's not like you're waiting and your only money comes from that Amazon um, you know, payment. You know, Why is it important for authors and for creators to have multiple sources of income? Okay, so, well, for me, everything stems to 2008. I'm sure listeners can remember the global financial crisis. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so basically, I went to work, as many of us did. Um, it was around March, I think, 2008. And we walked in. I was on a floor, one of these awful open plan offices with about 400 other IT consultants. And, um, you know, our manager walks in with a stack of paper. And basically, we're all called in one by one into an office we're given the bit of paper which says um three weeks notice bye bye and we're all um contractors so they weren't even obliged to pay us anything and uh so we were all let go and this was many of us at one time so finding other work was clearly going to be an issue and i realized on that day because i was the major wage earner in my family um i was like holy crap this one company has just you know, told me to go away and, and I've essentially lost my only source of income. And I declared on that day that I would never do that again. And that was part of how I got into this. And this is very interesting because you'll find a lot of entrepreneurs these days who were who were made by the global financial crisis. Either they were laid off or like I was or their life pivoted around that moment. And for me, this is why I am I publish wide, which means I don't just publish on Amazon. So at the moment I'm selling um, you know, books on all the big platforms, iBooks, Kobo, as well as Amazon, Nook. Um, I'm selling on uh, in all the bookstores, libraries. Uh, you know, I, I've sold books in 86 countries. So even just I do audio books. You know, even just with books, I'm I'm all I'm I'm doing a lot of streams of income. But then I also, as you say, I I have speaking, uh, which is much less of a income stream now. Um, but I have affiliate income, which means as I blog and podcast, I point to other people's products, and I will get that I absolutely love and I will get commission on the sale and then I have advertising and my Patreon which we'll come to and uh yeah those are my main yeah advertising sponsorship type revenue um yeah, those are my oh and courses i do courses as well so i teach <laughs> so many i'm just trying to think oh my goodness <laughs> but this is the thing i actually i'm at the point now where i'm up to i think around 120 different sources of income and some of those are 50 cents a month and some of them are thousands so this is the thing and that you know i don't obviously focus my attention on on the little ones all the time but by building up all these streams of income i am not dependent if amazon changed their rules tomorrow I, I am not destroyed. And if any of them change their rules, I'm not destroyed. And that, to me, is how you are truly independent. Which, in a sense, there's nothing new about this advice, right? If you go to a financial advisor, the very first thing they're going to say is you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't put all of your money in you know, blockbuster stock because you don't know if it's going to go up or go down. You want to diversify your assets. And yet, for so many of us, when it comes to income, it's all dependent on one person, our boss. <laughs> it's like, and that one person has so much power over our lives. Whereas, you know, the way you've structured your life, you know, if, if Patreon were to shut down or Amazon were to shut down, any one of them or even several of them could fail at the same time and you're not in the soup kitchen line, you're able to, you know, you have runway. And one of the things I imagine you're doing, and I, I definitely do this, is having money and savings. <laughs> you know, part of being a freelancer, part of being an entrepreneur is that you can't live paycheck to paycheck. You have to adjust your lifestyle down so that you're living on less than what you're making um, in case there's that unevenness. And as you get a more mature mature income stream that those waves, you know, even out, but it's still good to have that foundation. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because winding back to like 2011, um, what happened is obviously I was working a consulting job. So I was, I was working really hard and didn't have much bandwidth for the business. Um, but I was blogging. I'd written, I think, four books by then um, by getting up really early and working at the weekends and everything. And I went to four days a week. But then there was a moment when my husband and I, I said to him, look, if I, I need to give up my job 
because I have to do this next step. Um, but what I said to him, so what we did, I mean, bless him, he's amazing. And of course, now he works in the company as well. Um, but I said, we're going to have to sell our house. <laughs> we have to downsize. We're going to start selling the car. We are uh, pretty much moving. We moved from a four bedroom house to a, a one bedroom flat. Um, and we re- so we moved to rental income, which essentially is much more fixed. So you don't have like the surprise boiler, you know, costs or whatever. So we uh, downsized. I had six months money in the bank. And I said to him, if I can't make this work in six months, I will go back to my day job. And of course, I never went back. So but what I had done, so I left in 2011, but I started writing in 2006, started publishing and blogging and uh, in 2008, started podcasting 2009. So it took me f- three to four years doing what they now call the side hustle, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, wasn't around again when I, when I was doing it, but doing things on the side um, in order to then be able to move out of my job. And then it took from 2011 to 2015 for me to return to the um, income that I was uh, on before. So it really was a, a, a quite a long journey, but I always, and this is what I would say to people, just be aware of what you want. Like, what are you aiming for? What is the goal? Why are you doing this? And for me, it was always, I want to measure my life by what I create and measure my life by the people I can help. And that just kept me going through the what Seth Godin calls the dip. Um, you know, that point where things look a bit bleak, but you need to you need to go through that in order to move to a different career, because that's basically what this is. I reread the dip uh, almost annually. Every time I have a big decision or I'm like facing a life choice, I go back and reread the dip by Seth Godin. And the most recent time I read it was just a couple of uh, weeks ago. And oh, talked- are you going through a dip? <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm starting oh. this new podcast and, you know, all of these new uh, things that I'm doing and trying to decide what to prune. And one of the things that he said uh, that jumped out at me this time I read the book was he said, it's smart to not try something. And it's smart to start something and to um, work your way through the dip. But starting things over and over again where you quit in the dip is really foolish. Like you either need to um, do it for real or you need to not do it. And part of because one of the things he talks about in that book is how important it is to quit and quit the things that aren't going to make it, you know, prune the tree, so to speak, so that you can focus on Uh, doing one thing well. And I think that your story is a really good illustration of this because you didn't start everything all at the same time. You didn't start the podcast and the, you know, merchandising and the, you know, writing for writers and the writing fiction all on the, you know, 2006. You started one and you got it up to a good point and then you started the next one and you're able to add and go from success to success. And I think that that's the right way to do it instead of starting them all, getting into the dip and then quitting. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, many of this wasn't around <laughs> when when I, I started. But the, I think there's, there's two answers. You know, one is a lot of this wasn't around. So Patreon's a great example was just not there. Um, it, when I started self-publishing, there was no Kindle. There was, you know, ebooks were downloadable PDFs from people's websites, <laughs> which is just crazy. Um, you know, oh, ebooks were not mainstream. <laughs> I know. Well, well, what's even funnier, it was 2007 was the, um, the iPhone. The iPhone came out in 2007 um, and also the Kindle. So those two technologies for me were the things that enabled me pretty much to move into being a full-time creative. But the other thing is that some of the things I did do at the beginning are still the engines of my business. And in fact, the main reason I make um, good money from affiliate marketing is because I've been blogging since 2008. And I took a course in blogging from the lovely Yarrow Starak from Entrepreneur's Journey. And what I learned from Yarrow around SEO, so search engine optimization and content marketing, it wasn't even called content marketing back then, but it, but basically the emphasis was on providing value for your audience and do not try and game anything. Um, you know, back in 2008, gaming SEO um, and gaming the Google algorithm was, was a thing. You know, everyone did that, the black hat SEO stuff. Uh, and the school I come from, the kind of copy blogger um, generosity value school is write quality things that stand the test of time and you will eventually 
reap the benefits of this. So while for between sort of 2008 to 2012, I was blogging about self-publishing and nobody cared, like I was nobody cared, seriously. And then <laughs> from sort of 2012, because of the Kindle, because of because self-publishing went mainstream in America, my website became one of the top websites in the niche because I it has really good Google rank because it's been around so long and because I have consistently done quality um, writing on it. So this is a an interesting thing is that my business now, my income now, is based on 10 years of content marketing, so blogging and podcasting. I'm, I'm at nine years of podcasting right now, which is in, in the podcast space, as you know, is pretty old. <laughs> but, you know, in those days, people were downloading podcasts onto iPods. <laughs> I remember doing that. I was, yes. I had a podcast Well, we didn't call days. them podcasts, really. We call them kind of just downloadable audios, right? <laughs> there was the word podcast wasn't even mainstream. That's right. So speaking of podcasting, I want to talk a little bit about your podcast because you were one of the first ones into the space. Why start a podcast? podcast for writers? Well, um, again, so the guy I learned from Yarrow, um, he was doing a lot of downloadable audio. And I was like, I really like learning this way because I'm I'm commuting. I was driving at the time. I was living in Australia. So my commute was maybe an hour each way in the car. So obviously listening was the way I was learning. And I was changing my mindset, which I think audio is so powerful. I also started listening to a few podcast fiction authors. So Scott Sigler being a really big one, um, still an amazing fiction author who still podcasts his fiction. And so I was like, wow, this is a powerful medium. Uh, and then I think Yarrow said something like, you know, you can learn by doing this. And I realized that there, there was nobody. Like at the time, there was pretty much nobody doing anything in self-publishing um, on audio or podcast. Um, so I was like, okay, or they were in the speaking niche and the nonfiction niche, but definitely not in the sort of fiction niche and, you know, that kind of thing. And many authors are quite scared of technology. So they, I was, because I come from a more technical background, I thought I could do this. But, you know, I kid you not, the first episode I did, which is in March 2009, I phoned up the lady, like, on a proper phone. <laughs> if people know what that is. <laughs> With a uh, little you know, twisty <laughs> wire that goes into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. But there was a speakerphone button. So I put the phone on speakerphone and then I held a recorder next to the phone and I did an interview basically holding and I've, that episode is still up don't be ashamed of your past <laughs> there's nowhere but, to go but up in terms of audio quality if that's where you start exactly exactly so but amazingly that started me off into podcasting and I realized that you could talk to some pretty big names by doing something that they are not that comfortable with and so, yeah, I mean, some of the people I've interviewed over the years are not, you know, you can't hire them. You can't book them as, uh, you know, consulting, but they will do a podcast interview. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, this is what's so interesting. So my attitude there was I wanted to learn. I was also pretty lonely, so I didn't really know any authors. So I thought maybe I could find a community if I start trying to help people. Um, so really, I started the podcast because I wanted to learn and help people. And that is still a part of it. It was actually only 2015 that I started to make money from my podcast. Yeah, and I want to talk about that because a lot of people who listen to the show, they're not authors, they are just podcasters. And there, you know, some people are like, is it possible to make money on a podcast? How do you specifically monetize your podcast? Okay, so um, basically, I'm very, very, very careful careful about the companies I associate with. I think uh, in the author space, as well as many other industries, there are companies that you won't, you don't necessarily want to be involved with who will offer you money. So one thing is get your ethics right, get your headset right before you move into monetization. Uh, that I think is really important. Then what I did, I started off with um, corporate sponsorship and that was based on relationships. So I um, was, you know, I'm, I've been speaking in the author niche for years and um, Kobo, who are uh, very big in Canada and now increasingly big or, you know, all over the world, um, their arrival to Kindle, um, they you know, I had a good relationship with them. So they're my primary sponsor of the podcast. And that was a literally a conversation at a conference. So that was personal relationships. And then I did, um, I came up with my figure based on downloads. So that's very important. If you've just started a podcast, I, I don't see how you can monetize a podcast from scratch unless you can find 
sponsorship in that way. But basically I had proven downloads that I could show from my, um, I, I use Amazon S3 for my hosting um, and also Blueberry without, you know, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y, Blueberry is my um, kind of publisher. And I had downloadable, you know, figures from them so I could prove what the sponsor would be getting. So that was the first thing I did. And now I have also Ingram Spark, who are a print on demand service and draft to digital, who are um, again, another ebook service, but all companies that I use myself and highly recommend. So I think that's really important. And the, and the other thing that I want to point out real quick is that these aren't just uh, products that you use, but they're products that are specifically interesting to your specific audience. So it's not like you're sleeping on a Casper mattress and you're recommending a Casper uh, mattress to your audience, which is fine, but Casper will never pay you as much to sponsor your show as a business that makes something specifically for authors. Because the fact that you have such a focused niche, a lot of people are like, oh, well, if I have a niche, I can't get sponsors because I won't have as many people listening to my podcast. I should talk about some TV show. It's like, yeah, but you may have fewer people, but those people are more valuable to the right kind of advertiser. Like Kobo isn't going to advertise on an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast, right? There's like, you know, for every <laughs> one person who's oh, interested in know. Kobo, <laughs> there's yeah. 99 people who are like, what is Kobo? I, like, I have never written a book, right? But for your podcast, every single person who's going to listen to a podcast about writing and publishing is a potential customer for Kobo. And so your audience is particularly attractive to them. Yes. And I, I would go so far as to say, unless you are Tim Ferriss you know you need to go niche like you really do I mean I know Tim I think you you mentioned that you know I don't know Tim I mean I know Tim's podcast and he does have some really random stuff on there I think he had Casper on there um and you know but when you have that many figures that many downloads every you know every week you can be sure that some of it's going to hit but as you say I mean in these niches, you can get rabid fans who are looking for specific stuff. And thus having a podcast on a niche is going to make it enable you to make more money. Um, I have a, a someone who listens to my podcast who's into, um, you know, those sort of military figures, um, mini figures that they do um, battles and things with. And I and he started a Patreon and he got he got really a lot of money very quickly from his very small demographic <laughs> and I was he's already I think he's overtaken me and I've been doing it like two and a half years <laughs> and I'm like wow that's a really you know because they're very hungry because nobody else is catering to that market so I totally agree with you it's a very good idea so um just back on my podcast so I have corporate sponsors I have a patreon now um which is I, I do two episodes a month I charge for and uh that has definitely come up now to a, you know a good level and I also do my own marketing so for example I'm launching a course on how to write non-fiction in a couple of weeks and I will take the marketing slot in the podcast you know the mid-roll and I will advertise my own products um, so I'll advertise the audiobook I'll advertise my premium course um, so I'll basically use that slot which my audience now expect for myself. So that that's kind of multiple ways to to market. And and the nice thing about that is that you already have an audience that knows likes and trusts you and you're getting 100% of the money because it, it's your own product. Yes. With audiobooks particularly, like if if there are authors listening and you haven't done audiobooks and you have a podcast, I mean, it's a captive audience for <laughs> audio. I mean, all they need to do is switch over to whatever app and buy the audiobook. Um, you know, it you can and if you don't know, you can use a ACX, the letters acx.com to independently publish audiobooks now. It's it's really incredible what we can do as independents. And I'm making, you know, decent money on with audiobooks, nonfiction particularly, every month because I'm able to talk about that on the podcast. And I don't even narrate my audiobooks. <laughs> so it's a, it's definitely a tangential thing. Yeah, that's really good. I, I narrated my uh, audiobook and then I did partly because I already have, have all of the equipment. And it was, it's not as easy as recording a podcast. I'll say that. It is soul crushing, but it is also yes, very which rewarding. is why I hire a professional <laughs> yeah. because, yeah, I was just like, I did it once. I had done business for authors. That is uh, read by me. And no, I won't be doing it again. <laughs> it's so hardcore. <laughs> yeah, so I I, ha I hired a college student to edit it because I'm like, I can't hear all of my mistakes. I'll, I will hate myself forever if I do this. But I w real quick, I want to zoom in on your Patreon because uh, you are using you're doing some creative things with Patreon. Walk us through your levels. What are the price points? 
and re- w- what rewards do people get uh, for those rewards in your Patreon? Well, it's so funny that you, you've asked me this as if I know what I'm doing, because when I started it, see, what happened was I got to a point in 2015 where I had to make a decision about my podcast. So I'd been doing it since 2009. It wasn't, it was taking me, you know, you know how long these things take because you have to research the person, you have to do the recording, you have to edit it, you have to do all the show notes, blah, blah, blah. It can take three hours or even four hours to do a one hour show. And my shows are all like an hour long. So I was like, I have to give this up. I really was going to give up my podcast And then someone said to me, well, either you give it up or you go for it and you fund it. And I was like, okay. And someone suggested Patreon. And this was the early days of Patreon. Um, Well, that I knew about anyway, I suppose. Um, I think it has been going a while, but I hadn't heard about it. So I went on and at the time I was doing two shows a month. So and I was doing them quite sporadically. So I went on Patreon and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I just, and I thought nobody would sponsor me. I really did not expect anything. So I just went for, in terms of my levels, I was like, okay, one pound, you know, one dollar per show twice a month is like, yay, thanks so much. And then three dollars per show twice a month. And because I was only doing them twice a month, um, you'll get, uh, oh God, I can't remember what you get. You get like, uh... I think you get my ebooks or something. In fact, I mean, you might even get that at the top level. Like they're really not very well thought out. <laughs> my my strata. Um, and then at five dollars, you get my nonfiction books and uh, audio books and stuff. And but because and then what happened was I moved my show to every Monday uh, regularly on every Monday. And this is another big tip if you are going to do podcasting, it should go out on the same day, same time at a specific period so it becomes a habit. So if I miss my Monday morning 7 a.m. Uh, UK, uh, 7 a.m. UK time slot, I get emails and tweets like, where's your podcast? Have you died? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So this is the thing. I mean, the funding for me for Patreon, I never expected it to get to where it is. So it's about, uh, I think it's about 900 US now per Uh, you know, per episode twice a month. So I'm still on twice a month, even though I do it four or five times a month. Um, But I'm very happy with that. You know, it's an extra two grand US a month. Um, I did go and see uh, Amanda Palmer the other night. I'm sure you know Amanda Palmer, uh, who is one of the biggest users of Patreon. And she has over 11,000 people on her Patreon. And she's now almost using it as her whole community management system. So I was very inspired by what she's doing uh, as a true creative artist to maybe revamp my own Patreon or perhaps start another one for my fiction or something else. So I do think what I would say to people is they have done so much with that system in the last year. I think they've really made a lot more of it um, that if you're starting now, you can do a lot more than what I've done. So definitely don't use me as a model. Um, Pick somebody who started more recently with more of their extended functionality. And that is, I think, a really important point. Some people are going to hear your story and they're like, oh, 10 years, that sounds so hard. And while some things do take time, they are also benefiting from the fact that you were using really old, really hard to use tools in those early days, right? Like making money as an independent author uh, before Kindle was a lot harder. (laughs) Making money with a podcast before Patreon is a lot harder. And Patreon now is very different than what Patreon was two years ago in terms of what it's able to do and how many users, right? Two years ago, no one knew what Patreon was. And when they back your campaign, that's the first time they're creating a Patreon account. Whereas now, as more and more authors get on Patreon and more and more readers are backing authors on Patreon, now it's not, I have to create a Patreon account. It's, oh, I just add another author to my account. And it gets easier every month uh, in when it comes to attracting patrons. Yes. And I think what's, ex- yeah, what's exciting about this world we live in is that people are more and more excited about supporting independence. So as being now I'm a supporter of Amanda Palmer, I get her uh, her emails and what she's up to and I get her songs before they go live to everyone else. Um, And with my Patreon, I do a private Q&A every month. So I actually just recorded that yesterday. So my patrons get an extra like 45 minute audio every month and they can ask their questions. So they sort of get access and I don't do consulting anymore I barely do speaking so it's an access thing that I'm giving and it's very it's fascinating to kind of see how these things have moved on but that um, 
it's much more normal now to support a creative directly like people would rather shop on on um you know not on the high street or etsy than they would going into the mall and in fact that's why we're seeing the death of the high street <laughs> and the death of the malls people are interested in the creator and the story behind the creator and that's i think you know as a tangential point your story is very important uh, so whenever you do something like this, if you do a podcast, if you do a YouTube channel, or whatever, make sure that you are the one who is heard over time and make sure you have a slot where you talk about yourself so that people get to know you. And because that's the secret with this stuff, they have to care about you. And the only way that people can care about you is if you are a little bit vulnerable and you share your difficult times and, you know, people will support you if you're honest about it and, um, and you give value very importantly, give a lot of value. And, and I think that's so key. And, and your Q&A episode is really great. I, so I back you uh, on Patreon. You're lovely. <laughs> so I, I get the Q&A <laughs> episode. And we do a Q&A episode very much like yours on novel marketing. And it's the easiest episode we do all month because we're just answering questions. And if we don't know the answer, sometimes we'll just say, I don't know. <laughs> Although usually we know the answer and it's very easy in terms of preparation. So we're not scheduling with a guest and doing all of this research to create it. And yet... And I feel like it's one of the most valuable pieces of content that we put out all month because we are answering specific people's specific questions. And so when you become a patron of Joanna Penn or you become a patron of Novel Marketing, suddenly you get to pick their brain and... You know, the dollar a month that they pay, you know, because you give it to everyone, even at the dollar level a month, we uh, have it just for the $5 level. But, you know, that's a cup of coffee, right? Somebody wants to buy you a cup of coffee and pick your brain. That's like the entry level. And if you're a consultant, it's a cup of coffee plus $300, right? Whereas with Patreon, uh, they get that access and hearing the questions that other patrons are asking it in is educational and it's good to hear those answers. And then the other benefit for you is that it keeps you from getting into the ivory tower. So I see this happen with experts where they start off and they're super helpful. Let's say somebody's teaching podcasting at the beginning. It's like what microphone to buy, but after a while they get bored with that basic content and their information gets more and more advanced until suddenly they're no longer understandable to somebody just getting started and they start losing their people because they get all the answers answered, the questions answered, and then they're not getting beginners because they are out of touch. And suddenly they're finding their revenue shrinking and having that where anyone who's a patron can ask you a question reminds you, it's like, oh, that's right. Not everyone knows what KDP is. Not everyone knows what it means to go wide. And it keeps you kind of relevant for that uh, beginner audience. That's so important. Yeah. And, but that, that does bring up another really important point, which is, um, the name of whatever you're doing. So uh, I have a lot of compatriots in the podcasting space who started podcasts with the word self-publishing in the title um, and have all of them have actually, well, all of them have fallen by the wayside of the ones that started around the time that I did. And there are new people who have come into the niche and are now using that word in their title. But what, as you say, what happens as the creator is that you develop and you move on and what you learn is also important. So what to me, like one of the biggest tips is you must, must, must have a website slash podcast slash whatever you're doing that will last. So don't hem yourself in too much with the title, even though we talked about going quite niche, still don't hem yourself in too much. So I had um, the creative pen, pen with a double N, was my um, third blog. And the other two were very much short lived because I ran out of stuff to write about. I ran out of anything to talk about because I didn't care anymore. But the creative pen, you know, I could become a painter. Um, I can do whatever I want with that as long as it's some kind of creative <laughs> <laughs> work. Um, but it also means that I have I have moved on and I have talked about this on the show that as I move on into, you know, the upper levels, I guess, of my own career, I can still um, talk about things that are relevant to people. And in fact, some of my listeners say that they have left those other shows behind because they don't cover the, the later things. So I think this is very important when you're planning your content and your site is if it does take, let's say it takes a year or two years or five years to get to, let's say, six figures, which I think is probably likely. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. But you know, um, then what, 
what are you going to be excited about for the next five years or 10 years? Like this December, I'll be coming up to 10 years on the creative pen. And I still, my content is scheduled six months out because I have so much I want to share. Uh, so what do you, what do you think you can be excited about over the long term? And that's so important. That's a really great point. And I know exactly what that's like. I wrote a blog post about dating and relationships that went crazy viral, it had a million page views in a month and it led to a book and a Kickstarter. And I knew that I did not want to talk about dating for five years or 10 years. <laughs> like this is a topic that's like, <laughs> I don't want to stay in this world uh, because it, and because I just, it wasn't a topic that I was that passionate about. And so I very, you know, like consciously, and a lot of people are like, why aren't you pushing your book more? You know, why aren't you, you know, it's such a good book, you know, people need to, and I was like, because I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> there are other people who want to, like, they're uh, psychologists and they're, you know, like, they are looking for more clients and that is their world. And I'm like, let those people do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to let them take it because you really do have to have, you know, passion such an overused word, but it, you have to be motivated to go it the long way uh, because you're exactly right. There's no overnight successes in this business. It, often when you look at somebody who looks like they went from, you know, a little bit of money to a lot of money. If you look into their story, they've been preparing for a really long time. You know, like YouTubers often, they'll get a shout out from some really popular YouTube channel and suddenly their number of subscribers will explode and their revenue will explode. But there are other YouTubers where that same shout out happens and they don't explode. What's the difference? Were they putting in the time? When people go and watch the second video on their channel, is that video exciting, right? And like, what's the quality of the average stuff? That average quality content has to get to a certain level before you really get that big following. And it takes time to build your craft, whether it's in podcasting or writing or in um, video creation. And uh, there's really no shortcuts. And I wish we had time to talk about all of the other things that you're doing. because <laughs> we, we haven't even gotten to affiliate marketing, which you're doing really well by like curating really great content. And that's a great source of content. And of course, your nonfiction is doing well on your YouTube channel. But I really appreciate you coming on. And you have such a wealth of knowledge. Maybe I'll be able to talk to you into coming back. We hit these other aspects at some point in the future. <laughs> but I don't want this episode to go on forever. Oh, no. No, but I, I would say on that that I think the important thing is where, whether you're starting a podcast or a blog or whatever or a YouTube channel or whatever you're doing, you have to enjoy the process or whether you're writing books. This is very important for writing books. You have to enjoy the process and feel that the conversation is worth it. So this is, I think, the third time that you and I have, have chatted, right? I've been on your, your show a number of times and I keep coming back because I enjoy talking to you. And I get a lot out of our conversation because I think you're a smart guy and, and Jim is as well, obviously. And this is the novel marketing <laughs> um, podcast he's not that here. she's talking about. <laughs> yeah, and, and I enjoy our conversation. So I get something out of this too. I like helping other people, but I also enjoy our conversations. And so I think, and if nobody else was listening, we've still had an interesting conversation. So I think that has to be the way that you go into this. Like with writing, if no one else ever sees this, is this is still worth my time and for me that's the only thing that will keep me going because otherwise I might as well go back to my day job I mean really so I think big message you know it's not necessarily passion but it's certainly interest and you have to keep wanting to do this for its own sake and the money I can't say the money will come but the money will likely come if you focus on both the craft and the business side and educate yourself and put yourself out there so so yeah I really I think this show is great oh, by the way you. so lots of things I've subscribed Yay. it's great and I, and I just want to say that that's so important that if you have destination fever it's like i will not be happy unless i'm a best-selling writer and then it's like you get there and it's like oh i won't be happy till i have a second bestseller to prove that it wasn't a fluke and then oh i won't be happy until it's new york times bestseller oh not until it's a movie not until it's a good movie right there's always some milestone ahead of you and i will say working i've worked with new york times best-selling authors who are miserable because there's some other author they're comparing themselves to that is more successful <laughs> it's like if you enjoy the journey you can have that joy even when you're doing it in obs obscurity and that motivation is ultimately what's going to lead to success and I love what I love about that is that it applies regardless right like that is it doesn't matter what you're creating you have to you have to be able to put in the work uh, Joanna where can people find out uh, more about you 
Uh, and, where, and tell us specifically about your podcast. Yes, sure. So come on over to The Creative Pen Podcast, Pen with a Double N, and find out about writing, uh, independently publishing, book marketing, and making a living with your writing. Uh, also, thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N, and you can get the free author blueprint, which is all about as I said before, <laughs> writing books. Um, and also, if you have any questions, you're welcome to tweet me at the Creative Pen. And we will have links to all of those in the show notes. So if you just scroll down in your uh, podcast app on your iPhone or whatever app you're using, you don't even have to leave the app. Just scroll and you can tap those uh, links to find Joanna in all these different places. And I really do encourage you to check out her podcast and check out what she's doing at Patreon. I know she's very humble. She's like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. She's doing it very well. <laughs> so check it out. You can learn a lot uh, from... Uh, uh, someone like Joanna Pan. So Joanna, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Thomas.